Okay. Can we have everyone take their seats, please? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Ambrose, Exec Executive Vice President for uh, Lockheed Martin Space uh, Systems Company. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce our next session. From Pyongyang to Brussels, frying pan to fire. And that should excite you for this topic. Our speaker today is General Curtis Scaparati. It is no stranger to challenging situations. He has led combat forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, overseen peacekeeping peacekeeping operations on multiple continents and directed policy inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Having recently transitioned from the tremendous responsibility of overseeing the Korean Peninsula to his current role as Supreme Allied Commander Europe, General Scaparati is confronted with a resurgent Russia, a migrant crisis of staggering complexity, and a myriad of other strategic threats such as the recent unrest experience in the streets of Turkey. Our moderator, who will keep us explore General's dynamic environment, is the renowned David Ignatius, a best-selling author and prize-winning contributor to the Washington Post. I'm confident David's robust experience and extreme understanding of the foreign policy issues will serve us well this evening. This promises to be a, an interesting discussion, so with that, I'll turn you over to David. So uh, thanks to Rick. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, General Scaparati. He is known to his colleagues uh, in uniform as SCAP. On the stage today, he's going to be General Scaparati. Um, General Scap is good. Well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare try that. But uh, <laughs> So I asked a, a, a colleague who'd served with uh, General Scaparati uh, in uniform today to describe him in a few words. And he said simply that he is a soldier soldier who has served in every tough command. I'm just going to briefly list them for you. It's a sort of history of our military over the last 20 years. He served in the Balkans. He served as an assistant division commander in Iraq in 2003. He served twice in Afghanistan as uh, the, uh, I believe, commander of the 82nd Airborne and then as the Number two, the Corps commander, uh, he was the J-3 with CENTCOM, where I first mm -hmm. met him, serving under, under General Abizade. He was the Joint Staff Director, and then he went off to command our forces uh, in South Korea. Now he is the European commander and the, and the NATO uh, commander. So I want to start with, with, uh, with the fire, uh, using our title, and then we'll get back okay. to, the, to the frying pan. To start with Russia. General, when you got out of West Point in 1978, you had trained to fight a country called the Soviet Union. Uh, and then that world uh, changed. And now, as you come back to command uh, our forces in Europe, we all have this sense that the world has come full circle. In May, when General Scaparati took over his command, he said, using a phrase that's often used, I'm told, in Korea, that he wanted the U.S. and its allies to be ready to fight tonight, meaning that this is a command now where we have to think of imminent danger. I want to ask you to begin by talking about Russia uh, and your evaluation of Russia as a, a potential adversary. We've watched Russia deploy new forces, new doctrine in Ukraine, in Syria. I'm interested, I know we all are, in what's impressed you, uh, what you're not so impressed by, but more fundamentally, what you think as NATO commander, as U European commander, what we should do about Russia. Well, you know, thank you, David, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, today. Thank you very much. Um, you know, you mentioned coming out of West Point in 78. I, I actually took Russian as the language at West Point because I thought it'd probably be good I could learn a little bit about the culture and the language of my adversary. So that's how focused, you know, I was at the time when I came out. Learned the doctrine, you know, knew their formations, and actually as a young officer went to Reforger on multiple occasions um, to be prepared to fight them. And I was, you know, something I would share with you as you go through the career. Um, 
I was in Germany with 10th Mountain Division on an exercise. Um, I'd been out about two nights. We had done a night infiltration. I was a major at the time. And I linked up with a classmate of mine from West Point by chance. I came to the edge of the woods. We ran into each other. And he said, he said, Scaff, did you hear the wall came down today? I've never forgotten that moment. I was standing there, you know, a couple, couple of nights of, of hard work and uh, camouflage on. And I remember thinking, my gosh, you know, we're, this changes everything. So that was, you know, that was uh, the early years. And, uh, and then in 90. Six ninety five. We went in December ninety five. I led the airborne combat team into Tuzla as we went into Bosnia. And about a month later, I did a relief in place of the area that I was responsible for to a Russian airborne brigade. And I remember thinking, not in, not in a hundred years would I have thought, particularly when I was going through West Point, that I would actually do a relief in place, a, a friendly exchange with a Russian airborne brigade. And then you come full circle to the job I have today, and, and Russia's back. Um, so to get to your question about them being back, um, I'm impressed with the fact that they've taken a force that really had some serious problems only a few years ago. You can see that they've instilled discipline in their force when you just watch what you can see of, of their work, their photos, um, the dress of their, their personnel. Um, you can see that, um, that they're learning. While they're, much of their doctrine is based in the early Soviet doctrine, they are pretty agile of thinking if you look at the recent writings that their officers are doing. So they're actually taking a look at the world around them as they see it and adjusting their doctrine uh, off that basis, which is impressive. And they're clearly modernizing. They've reorganized their force. They've made it smaller so it could be more professional. Um, they, uh, when you look at the weapon systems, et cetera, they've been watching us. And so you mentioned the demonstrations. They've, they've fired long range precision missiles uh, from submarines, from surface ships, from medium bombers, uh, all at Syria. They certainly didn't need to launch them from that distance, but they did so, so they could, one, probably train, exercise, and then demonstrate it. And, uh, and so I'm impressed with that as well. So we have, a, you know, we have an adversary here that we have to take very seriously. And they're going to continue to uh, improve in their capabilities, in my opinion. Now, real quickly, we can talk quite a bit about what we need to do. I could probably fill the time with it. But first of all, we have to, you know, we have to be strong. And we also have to look at the world around us and be prepared to invest uh, in the force that we need to invest in the capabilities that we need to continue to stretch ourselves so that we outpace these capabilities that they're developing. We need to do that in the United States, and as the SAC here, we need to do it as a NATO alliance as well. Um, when you look at Wales in 2014, the summit, and then the Warsaw summit that we just had, you can see that, that NATO has realized the challenge. There was, and I can talk about this if you want in a minute, uh, they, they have shown adaptation between that time. And then in Wales, they reconfirmed, or I mean, in, in Warsaw, they re, reconfirmed this. Uh, I want to get to, get to Warsaw and the commitments and how credible they are in, mm -hmm. in just a moment. But I want to ask you about a subject that's come up in almost every panel that we've had uh, today, mm -hmm. and that is the... Uh, seeming uh, Russian hack of the DNC and then subsequent yeah. disclosure by somebody of that information. I, I don't want to ask you to comment on the details of that. Nobody has all day. But, but I want to... <laughs> and I, I will need that. A little bit. <laughs> but, uh, but we keep trying. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want to ask you about what the Russians have been up to in Europe, in your area of, mm -hmm. of responsibility. There have been repeated uh, news stories about uh, the, the Russians uh, funding uh, uh, phony uh, news outlets, about Russian contributions to right-wing political parties in Europe, which have had the effect, obviously, of destabilizing the political situation. Uh, all sorts of what uh, Vladimir Putin and his, his former intelligence colleagues call active measures. Right. So th this is clearly a country that uses these active measures, quite apart from whatever happened uh, in the DNC hack. 
So I want to ask you, uh, mm -hmm. as, as UCOM commander, uh, most of all, what do we do about an adversary that uses those tools? Are we really able to combat uh, those kinds of tools and, and stay, stay faithful to our own values uh, and laws? Well, first of all, I, I would just tell you that um, we, we've been calling this, you know, you hear it as war, hybrid warfare or I, I, activities short of conflict. But I would tell you that, you know, we see the activity in, in cyberspace. Uh, we see uh, influence in Europe uh, in terms of uh, political parties, uh, funding, um, some misinformation uh, to build uh, facts on the ground that, that really aren't true. Uh, and what I would say to you is I, I believe that it's a part of their doctrine. In essence, uh, when you look at the range or the spectrum of conflict, it begins with activities below the threshold of conflict in order to set conditions and perhaps even be successful uh, in their objectives without even, you know, uh, approaching a conflict. So I think it's part of their doctrine. I think we can expect to see them continue it. Personally, um, I think we can deal with it. Um, it's difficult, particularly for the Western world, because in the West, you know, we, we believe in freedom of the press. We believe in being truthful in the press. We believe in the rule of law. So we have difficulty approaching and countering this, but we have to. And I think the best way we do it is we need to be uh, very bold about putting the spotlight on it, that when we know it's true, we make sure it's known, that we, we get it out there. Uh, the other is, is that we have to use the whole of government approach, both as a country in the United States but within NATO, in order to do our own information, factual information, uh, to make sure that that's out there, uh, to make sure that, that um, you know, we are forthright with our partners uh, in helping them establish democratic institutions, et cetera. Those are the things we can do. And the final thing, David, I would say that you know, in Warsaw, uh, NATO and the EU made a commitment. They actually signed an agreement to work together. That's, um, that's pretty remarkable for these two organizations. But what I think is important about it, it's about cooperation and the understanding that the EU provides talents and skills and insights that we don't have in NATO. It's not, it's not what we do. And together, with our security expertise, I think we can do some good things, precisely when you talk about the cyber threat and, you know, the threats in hybrid warfare. If, if I understand you, what you're saying, in effect, is that part of what NATO has to do in combating this adversary with this uh, set of, of tactics is to employ what people often call information operations. In other words, right. meet them in that battle space. Am I we understanding do. that? That's right. And, you know, if you, if you look at it with the Russians, if you look at this with, you know, counter uh, ISIL or counter terrorism, which we also have uh, in Europe, um, you know, we have to become uh, more um, uh, adept and also more uh, prepared and willing uh, to use information operations. And, and we can be true to what we always have professed, and that is, is that we're truthful in our information operations. I, I, would, I wouldn't be faithful to my own profession if I didn't express anxiety about information <laughs> operations uh, and the possibility that they'll blow back in ways that, that hurt us, but we have laws, and I, I'm sure you'll be thinking carefully about, about yeah. how, how to do this. I want to ask about the, the Warsaw Summit, which just uh, finished uh, this, this month. Uh, the, the Warsaw Summit, uh, was notable to me for agreement on the rotating deployment of four battalions mm -hmm. in the Baltics and in Poland, a, a, a more uh, aggressive step that the Russians have said they really didn't want to see happen. And the idea, is, as it was explained, is that this is a tripwire, much as we used to have a tripwire in the days of the Soviet Union where the Soviets couldn't advance without killing some Americans and, and, and risking a, a broader conflict, that we're going to have the, the, these forward de deployed forces, not, not large in, in number. I want to ask you um, to, to talk about that, but, but to, to be pointed in, in asking whether it's really credible. The, yeah. the implicit idea is that we will sacrifice Chicago, 
let's say, or, or Aspen, uh, to say Vilnius, mm -hmm. that, that our commitment is such that if you trip the wire, uh, you are in a conflict situation in which Americans are prepared to, to so is that, it was, it was always a question in the Cold War of how credible that was. How credible is it today? Oh, I, I think it's credible. I mean, what uh, strikes me about Warsaw, first of all, is 28 nations came together. They agreed on a communique. If you've seen it, it's 118 paragraphs. But they came together and made this commitment. They recommitted to Article 5 in the Baltics, essentially, and said they'll come to defense of those countries. Now, you know, you can, you can look at this as a tripwire, but I look at it as a commitment, you know, and, and within deterrence, you've got to have both the capability and the intent or the will, and that has to be understood in the mind of the adversary. So this is a way to tell them, to demonstrate to them that we, we are committed to this and we do have the will to defend Europe. Now, the other point I want to make is we focus on, you know, those four battalions and enhanced forward presence, but there's much more to that. Uh, those battalions are a part of the individual nations, the forces that they have there as, a, as their commitment to NATO as well. It's a part of, uh, you know, our air domain and the forces that we have there in NATO and the United States within Europe. The maritime domain is part of that. Cyber is part of that. 28 nations diplomatic capability and information capability is part of that. So deterrence is, is a much bigger piece of this than those four battalions. And that's what creates deterrence. And I think in the mind of Putin and the Russians, the idea that you don't want to do this. You won't succeed and the cost is gonna be far too high compared to any benefit you think you may get. So to push this uh, qu question of, of credibility of this commitment, let's imagine that an American political candidate said that. Has anybody answered this the, question today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to phrase this in a way that you won't say, I can't possibly comment on that. Uh, let's imagine that an American politician, no. not even a candidate, um, said that, that America's willingness to back up its Article 5 NATO commitment to defend allies that are under attack would be subject to our review of, of whether they'd been spending what they promised. So the way I want to put the question is, you're NATO commander. You are the person that 28 militaries look to for guidance. So let's say that one of your uh, counterparts uh, in Europe says to you, uh, General, I'm concerned about whether the American commitment is, is real. I read these things in the press. How do you tell that person? I'm sure this happens to you on every trip you make. How do you tell that person, yes, it's real? Well, you know, first of all, um, within NATO and even in, you know, Korea and the alliance there when I was there, these are, um, these are ironclad commitments that we've made within these alliances. And uh, they look to us for leadership. Um, every one of those countries did in both places that I've been. And so it's not unusual for them to read our news from time to time and say, Scap, what do you think about this? It's the reassurance that they need. You know, in NATO, as I said, we committed uh, to NATO uh, many years ago, but we recommitted in Warsaw again uh, to Article 5. And, um, and I'm, I'm certain of that commitment. And, you know, you can, one thing they need to know is they can count on the United States to do what we say we're going to do. So um, just to play the, the devil's advocate and... Uh, thinking of this uh, entirely imaginary political figure um, who complains that the Europeans are not, in some cases, paying what they promised, paying their fair share for defense. Um, isn't that uh, hypothetical uh, political candidate correct in making that argument? I mean, isn't that true that the Europeans are not uh, stepping up to the, to the commitments that, that they make? So on the other well, hand of this, how, how do we say to them, you really must do what you promised or you're going to risk losing political support in America, quite apart from the unnamed individual. Well, you know, just set aside the, the, the uh, candidate or whatever. And, I, and I'll just tell you, you know, a personal story that you, first of all, in, in NATO, um, you know, I support the idea that we've committed to a 2% and of that percentage, 20% to modernization. It's very important. Without it, we're not going to outpace Russia's modernization. 
We've got to have that in order to provide a credible force like you talked about. So I reinforced that with them. Uh, and today in NATO, at Warsaw, we've got five countries out of 28 that have met that 2%. We've got 22 in this year that have, in, have increased their investment. So we're turning the corner on this, and we got strong commitments from them. What I would say to you, though, is that, um, is that I tell them, typically, um, that, look, we have a people and a Congress with a tough budget as well. And rightfully so, they want to make sure that our defense money is spent wisely and that we can take care of our people, too. So, you know, as a leader of another country, you have to put your share into this. You have to do that. Because when I go back to testify at Congress, I get asked these questions. When I go to Capitol Hill, I get asked these questions. And that's typically what I talk to them about, their responsibility based on the fact that we're here to help them. We've got some tough budget issues as well. They have to do their share. And I just approach it that way. Thank you for res responding to that. I, I, I know that's a, that's a tricky okay. issue for a person serving in uniform to, to answer. Another uh, question we've been talking about all day in different sessions is Turkey after yeah. the military yeah. coup. Turkey is a NATO member. Uh, Turkey's uh, military cooperation is something that's uh, right on your, on your plate. And that's a complicated issue after there's been a military coup mm -hmm. to have good relations w with the military. Um, you have uh, fought alongside Turkish troops right. uh, in Afghanistan. And you told me earlier today that you, uh, since you took over in May, have traveled to Turkey and met with uh, their uh, most senior military leadership. Um, I'm sure you're hoping to go back soon. soon. And so I want to ask, um, in this very delicate process, how we can work to keep Turkey an effective uh, member of NATO, and whether military to military cooperation, which has increased significantly in the last year, the opening of Insurlik Air Base to American operations was yeah. a big deal. How we can keep that going? Or maybe I should ask, can we keep that going in this, in this new environment? Oh, I think we can. I, the first thing I think about when you say, how do we keep, keep that going? It's about relationships. It's about presence. It's about uh, being there when they need you and working together on hard problems. Um, and the mill-to-mill -mill relationship is, is very important uh, in this case. Turkey itself sits right at really the crossroads of all of the challenges we see in Europe, whether it's the refugee issue, whether it's uh, counterterrorism, whether it's you know the Russians in Syria. Um, in every case, they've got the problems. They have a terrorist problem of their own. So you know it's very important as a NATO ally that we keep them strong. And I think we can do that. I, I would tell you that it was the first place that I visited after I took command. And I spent three days there. Uh, I spent a good deal of time with General uh, Akar, their, their Chad, for that reason. So that's an indication of how, you know, how important it is. And I've, I've talked to him since the coup. So, you know, my intent is, is that, uh, you know, as soon as I can, I'm going to go back. I'm going to see him again. We've talked since. And uh, we'll continue to, to uh, build where we need to, rebuild a relationship. Some of the officers that we have our relationships with in Turkey are now either detained, in some cases uh, retired, um, as a result of the coup. So we've got some work to do there. Do you, is there any way you can share at least the flavor of your conversation with your Turkish counterpart after the coup? I know that would be of interest to people. Well, it was, uh, I thought it was one. It struck me as a positive conversation. And what I mean by that was, you can imagine, uh, in, in his case, uh, he was taken hostage, separated from his wife, as I understand it. Um, so he had, a, a, I'm sure, a very long night on, on Friday night into Saturday when he was rescued by, I think, his, his special operations forces. Uh, but I talked to him several days after that. He was positive. Uh, he, he admitted that uh, there's, there's some, it's, it's stressful right now, uh, but we are committed. Uh, you have a solid ally. I appreciate your support. And, uh, and he said, you can come see me or visit me as soon as you want, which was, a, I think, a, you know, given all that he had to handle as the chief of their defense at that time was, was uh, a generous offer. 
President uh, Erdogan of, of Turkey is scheduled to meet with the President Putin, I think, on August 6, uh, in, in a week or so. And uh, I'm, I'm curious what you, as, as, as NATO commander, if there's, you know, obviously heads of state meet with each other all the time, friend and, uh, friend and foe, but is there anything that would concern you that might develop uh, Turkey and Russia have been on a, a process of improving relationships uh, r uh, lately. That, that um, could lead to a point where I, I assume it would give us concern from the standpoint of Turkey being a NATO member. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, you know, we've encouraged Turkey and uh, Turkey to try and, um, try and recover from the, the shoot down and, and, and solve that problem with the Russians. So it's positive that they're, that they're beyond that now and that they can talk because they're, they're working in such close proximity with us on their border in Syria that we really needed to get beyond that. So that was good. Um, and, and I think we'll watch closely in terms of how this relationship develops. Um, they, from my point of view, I would be concerned if it appeared that they were departing from, you know, the values that, that uh, is the bedrock of the Washington Treaty and NATO that they're a part of, uh, rule of law, um, uh, democratic institutions, etc. And uh, so that's what we'll watch closely, and we hope that uh, that, that will, you know, go in the right direction. I want to ask you a military uh, hardware question that, that I think many uh, members of this audience would be interested in, and forgive, forgive me if it's a little bit technical, but uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter and his Deputy Secretary Bob Work have uh, talked a good deal and, and thought a, a lot about what they call the third offset strategy. It's a strange name, but the basic idea is that deterrence against Russia is uh, more fragile than it should be. Mm -hmm. And that as in the past, when we had worries about, about deterrence, maybe we should leverage our technology. So they've said we have an enormous advantage, in particular in autonomous systems, our right. ability to use very advanced uh, IT to develop uh, systems that are dispersed, uh, hard, hard to uh, take out in a single mm -hmm. blow, so as to introduce uncertainty in the minds of a potential adversary like Russia, that if, if you take a step, you can't be sure uh, how we might react. And I, I wonder whether you, as, as, as UCOM commander, first of all, because mm -hmm. these are US uh, systems, whether this seems like a good path for us to follow. It, there are little bits of echoes of, of Star Wars. It's an area where we have such technological leadership. Is that the kind of thing we should leverage? Is it likely to be stabilizing? Or some people argue it could be really destabilizing. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I think it is the way we should go. And I, you know, when you look at uh, deterrence in the Cold War and you compare it to today, a lot has changed. I think it's much more complex today than it was in the Cold War in the sense that, you know, you have the speed of information, uh, tighter decision space. But one of the other things is technology. At, at that time, we had some clear technological leads that gave us great advantage in terms of, you know, credibility um, and will and uncertainty in their mind. And Technology today is uh, more dispersed, not only to nation states, but to non-state actors, et cetera. So we need to stay ahead of that. And I think it, it is important uh, uh, in our deterrence strategy, but it's also important in helping us in the way we fight, how we deal with that, with uh, the speed of information, um, the amount of information, uh, the closed decision space. We have to make decisions now, our senior leaders do, what we, we would have perhaps a week in the past that may be hours or best days today. And, you know, the, the machine and human interface, et cetera, can help us with those things, too. So I want to ask one more question about, about uh, European uh, NATO issues and then, and then uh, move a little more broadly. Uh, I had dinner Tuesday night before coming out here with a, a Russian defense analyst. I'm going to put quotation marks around that because you never know. Um, and. Um, <laughs> This, uh, this fellow said, uh, you know, you Americans are so focused on the Baltics and protecting the Baltics, uh, the people around Putin accept that the Baltics are in NATO, and that's not what we're thinking about. That's not how we're deploying our mm -hmm. forces. We're, we're thinking about Ukraine. That's, that's our focus. That's the real issue for, uh, for, for us. So I, I want to 
ask you to talk about U Ukraine and uh, start with, with, with this question. Our Secretary of State is trying very hard to rehabilitate and, and, and push through the Minsk process mm -hmm. for uh, stabilizing Ukraine and, and creating a kind of balance, a more decentralized political setup there, uh, satisfying some of the Russian concerns. Uh, from your perspective as, as a military commander, would that kind of outcome where the Minsk process was adopted lead to a, a stable Ukraine that would be a stable uh, buffer, or would it lead to perpetual instability among these fragments? How, how do you look at that? Well, I, first of all, we, we hope that we can work through the Minsk agreement and find stability there, because stability on the eastern flank or anywhere in Europe for instance, is very important to us. The Russians today in many of these areas, like that or Georgia, tend to keep this turmoil kind of churning. And that too, a day-to-day -day in Europe, is not a, a good thing. And it's a place where you could have conflict uh, because of miscalculation, whatever. So we, we, need to, we need to find a way to bring some stability to the area. And then, you know, secondly, um, we want to reinforce the sovereignty of a country that, um, you know, that's really what we stand for in the Baltics as well, is that nations have a right to determine the government that they want to have. And that's simply, in a basis, what we support. And, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, that that's a way forward. It will all, in the end, depend on how the Russians approach it, though. And, and give us your military assessment of, of Ukraine itself. The government, um, it, it's a very fractious place. It's a place where uh, all reporting says that corruption is a big problem. Are they moving toward a better ability to defend themselves, to, to use modern weapons? They, ha they have this enormous uh, military threat to their east. How do you think they're doing? Well, I, there's no question that they're working hard to build a better defense. Uh, our soldiers that work with them say that they're very focused they're tough. They're, they're good folks to train with and work with. Um, the, um, that's one point. Uh, two, they're in a very tight spot. You know, even what this last week, there was greater, um, you know, action along the line. They took some higher casualties. So they need our help in terms of that, you know, defensive posture. And then finally, in terms of the government, we're working with them as well to move them toward reform and, and uh, democratic institutions. And as you know, that's been somewhat difficult. They have some, some issues there with corruptions, et cetera, that we um, are leading them uh, to, uh, to reform. And they're going to need to do that to continue to, I think, have our help. Uh, Ukraine is not a NATO member, but um, What's the extent of our military-to-military -military, uh, relationship with them? Are we able to train their officers to help them uh, use the weapons they, they have from the various sources uh, more effectively, or are we uh, foreclosed from that? No, we're, we're actually, you know, assisting in um, training for, you know, communications, uh, small unit weaponry, um, counter IED, Things that they need in order to, you know, in order to reinforce uh, the line of contact, et cetera. So it's not full, it's not offensive by any means, uh, but it's defensive and it's helpful to the task they have at hand. So the the, the title of this session you'll remember is from the fi frying pan into the fire, and I left the frying pan, which is uh, General Scott Brady's previous command in in South Korea and the Korean Peninsula. Uh, for later in our conversation, but I, I do want to ask you to uh, speak a little bit about it. What, when you think about what the next president will inherit, will have on, on the desk uh, after, after January, high on that list, although we don't talk about it very often, is the reality that uh, North Korea, led by a very uh, belligerent, seemingly unstable leader, uh, will soon, in the term of the next president, have the ability to deliver nu a nuclear weapon onto U.S. territory in terms of all of the reporting that, that we see, uh, which, which is a really quite disturbing uh, prospect. So, so I'd like to ask you, you were deeply involved in, 
decisions when you were out there about how South Korea and the region can defend itself better. The starting point for me would be, is a situation in which North Korea can de deliver a miniaturized nuclear weapon atop an inter intermediate range missile onto Okinawa, let's say, or onto U.S. territory, is that an acceptable situation? Should, should, should we allow ourselves to be in that situation, in effect held hostage by a very unpredictable adversary? I think that North Korea is one, um, a country that, that today, and in the time that KJU's been in power, he has been very focused. Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un. He's been very- Known to his, his friends and adversaries as KJU. KJU. <laughs> he is young and he's brash, as you noted. Um, but he's also very focused on developing his military capability in specific ways that he knows is difficult for us. So he's very focused on his uh, developing his ballistic missile capability. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen him fire three missiles in one day. Uh, he's picked up the pace of this. And, you know, my estimate is, is that uh, he's testing and he's solving problems. He has a, you know, a submarine, submarine launch ballistic missile that he's working on as well. Um, and then he has a nuclear capability that he's continuing to build. And so, you know, I've said this before, I think that, that we need to continue in every way that we can to put pressure on this country uh, and to bring them to, the, to, to follow uh, the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Um, what I am concerned about is, I'm very concerned about what he has today, but I'm more concerned about what he'll have in three or four years when he has a, you know, a proven intercontinental capability, when he's perhaps uh, he's uh, figured out the submarine launch capability, uh, and he has uh, built more nuclear devices. So it's a serious problem. We had just today a, a little uh, news item uh, that I mentioned earlier to General Scott Brady, where a top uh, North Korean diplomat said that the U.S. in adopting one of these measures intended to pressure North Korea uh, and sanctioning Kim Jong-un uh, economically had, in this diplomat's words, crossed a red line, uh, and uh, that, that famous phrase, and that uh, if the U.S. and South Korea went ahead with a planned military exercise, I think it's next month, but if they went ahead with this military exercise, you know, there were a risk of war, and this is a declaration of war, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, you've dealt with a lot of yeah. threats from uh, North Korea. How do you respond to, to that kind of rhetoric? Yeah, personally, I yeah, just. Yeah, as a commander. Not, not, uh, doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, what we do is we watch who says it, what they say, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, we've, we've watched particularly North Korea long enough that there's patterns to this. So um, that's one way we look at it. So I always go back and take a look at that pretty closely. This is not, a, not unexpected. Uh, we put a sanction on Kim Jong-un, as I understand it. I think that's great. Uh, it needed to be done. And I think we need to continue the pressures along sanctions, working with our allies and by other means uh, to continue to put pressure on them and convince them that there's a different way. And hopefully bring China into this mix as well, because they're an important partner in solving this problem we've got in, in North Korea. And uh, it's a problem for them as well. You were, when you were uh, in the Korea Command, uh, a, a strong advocate of the theater missile defense system known as, as THAAD, which is now in the process of, of being deployed. How much uh, protection does that give to us and our friends uh, in the region against this very unpredictable yeah. threat? It's a very important system to put in because um, it, one is, they have a, a very significant uh, ballistic missile capability in North Korea, particularly short range, that, that uh, can hit our forces and uh, Korean forces and citizens in South Korea. What the THAAD brings to us is a high altitude intercept capability, a better, um, a, a better system for um, determining you know, our defensive um, strategy. In, in an attack, okay, because of its connection and radar to others. Um, and it gives us some capabilities that provide better protection 
to South Korea, not to mention that it's an area defense, not a point defense. So I can't go into that too much, but I would just say that I was very um, insistent that we try and bring that in because of the capability that it brings to the peninsula, and I'm glad to see that it's going forward. The, the Chinese, it's said, hate that um, and worry that it's a, a threat to their uh, capabilities, and to which our, our most senior diplomats have said, okay, then help us solve the North Korea problem uh, if you're, if you're right. concerned about that. That's correct. So, <laughs> so I, I want to um, close my uh, part of this conversation, then we'll turn to the audience, by uh, asking you to step back uh, just a, a little bit, General. Um, you are a, a, a prime example of the generation of U.S. Army officers, U.S. military officers, who've lived um, through this generation of war. The Army's been at war for 13 years. I asked uh, Ryan Crocker, I don't know if Ryan is, is here, but asked him earlier today, he knows General Scott Friday well from uh, Afghanistan and, and, and other places, and I just asked him what he remembered about, about serving with you, and he said uh, the thing he remembered uh, best, but most painfully, was going with you to Bagram Air Base yeah. uh, for the departure ceremonies when dead Americans were loaded onto planes to come home. And that's what you and your, your colleagues in uniform have been living with now for all these years. And I want to ask you to, to reflect uh, with this audience on what you've been living through, uh, on what that's been like for you as a, as a commander, on your hopes that we'll enter a different period in which we're not a country seemingly perpetually at war, uh, and just what, what this period of our history has been like for you. Um, one is, it, it, you mentioned Bagram. As the 82nd commander there, you have Bagram Airfield. That's where we do the, uh, that's where we do the return of remains uh, for departure from the country to go home. And, uh, if you're the commander there, there's almost a day that doesn't go by in the time that I was there that you didn't have one of those ceremonies. It's, uh, it's unbelievably difficult on the folks that go through that. And uh, it's something that, uh, that has affected me, I'll never forget it. But it's representative of the sacrifice that I've seen um, in you know, over a decade of war now. And we can't forget that even today, what we decide to do as senior leaders, there's soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines on the other end of that decision. And they're going to do what we tell them to do, but they also are willing to pay a heavy price for it. So we've got to keep that in mind. Two, um, that just reminds me that where we need to be, we need to resolve conflicts, and we need to get to a peaceful solution. Uh, because I've seen uh, too much. And there's no one that has done what our troopers have done, what our service members have done over the past 10 years, that will come back and say they're unaffected. I don't believe that. Well, I, I know we're all uh, moved to, to hear that. I, th I think something that we worry about sometimes, even as we uh, celebrate these uh, uh, remarkable sacrifices that the military has made, is that the military in America is becoming almost a separate uh, tribe. It, it has its own uh, rituals. It's a family. We we love that family, but it's it's uh, it's sometimes feels separate. Do you worry about that? Uh, that the military is too separate from the rest of American life? I do worry about it. I worry about um, it, it's not just the military either. I worry about service. You know, because we are a volunteer force. Um, you know, one percent serves, and I think in a democracy we have to think very hard about about that. Now, you might not necessarily serve in the military, but I think I tend, I've thought a lot lately about this. I think service to your country, even if it's for a year or two, in some means is of value, particularly in a democracy, and we ought to consider that. So, uh, on that note, we're going to go to the audience, uh, and I will recognize hands as I see them in the front row, my friend Kim Dozier. Uh, 
Uh, Kim Dozier. I know you can. With the Daily Beast and CNN. So um, could we expand a bit on some of your um, challenges coming up with Russia in terms of the missile shield that has been installed in Romania, will be installed in Poland. Um, the spokesman for Putin has said some very dire things about it being a threat. Yeah. Do they know it's not a threat? Is this a rhetorical counterattack? Or are they going to use this to try to separate you from some of the Baltic allies? Well, I think, first of all, I think they will use it or try to use it. They'll, they'll use almost anything they believe they can to separate, you know, countries within NATO. I mean, that's one of Putin's objectives is to try to create friction among the allies. So I think he'd use that anyway. The question of whether they really believe it's a threat, that, that's an interesting question for me because it is, uh, you know, it's a missile defense system. Um, it's not positioned in a place that if it were offensive system, that it, you know, it's not positioned in a position that as a defensive system that it can really impact at all their systems. In other words, impact their, their strategic deterrence. I'm certain that their military leaders should know that. So that's why I say it's an interesting question to me. I would like to fully understand it. Now, having said that, those who understand the Russians and have talked, those who have talked to the Russians recently, and I think this could very well be true, their leadership just simply does not believe that this is just a defensive system. Because you have, you have, a, you have the, the, um, the, the, the system itself can be used for an offensive capability. It's not structured that way. It doesn't have the technical nor the software to do it. But I'm told they believe that we're not being truthful about that. And that could, in fact, be the case. What's it really for? Yeah. So, they, uh, they could believe that, in other words. So. I want to ask uh, John Negropati and then, uh, ma'am, and uh, there was a gentleman here uh, in the far, but uh, first, uh, uh, Ambassador Negropati. Yeah, let me, let me clarify something, though. It was the way I said that. What I meant by that was, because <laughs> I heard somebody react to that. I'm not suggesting it's anything other than a missile defense system. That's what it is. They, they may not believe us. Yes, it's defending basically from the Middle East. It's, it's not oriented on them. It doesn't have the capability to do that. And we've been quite clear about it. Thank you, General. Uh, John Negroponte, I, I, if this were 40 years ago, we'd be thinking at least somewhat about triangular relationships between ourselves, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union, and China. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the sort of geostrategic relationship between Russia and China, and is there any res risk that we might end up uh, in the short term having? Thank you, sir. Um, you know, one of the things that I note about China and Russia is if you listen to their message to us, there are some similarities in the sense that China in the South China Sea claims that, you know, the, the um, international norms that we've established are constricting of what they see as their rightful territory and sphere of influence. Does that sound familiar? I mean, that's what you hear Putin say about, particularly in the East and the Baltics, that's their sphere of influence, that the Western um, set of rules is actually constricting uh, the way that they would like to operate. And so there's some similarities as you hear both leaders talk. That's of a concern in the sense that they could come together on this, I guess is what I'm saying. So I think we have to work hard to develop relationships with both of them and make sure that we're having quite candid communication with them so that we understand each other. There's a gentleman all the way in the, on the far right against, yes, st standing against the mesh of our tent, if we could get a microphone over there. Oh, okay, go ahead. Andrea Howard, I'm Naval Academy class of 2015. Go Army, beat Navy. Hey, beat Army, sir. <laughs> I wanted to get that in first because I knew you were, you were probably coming. Yes, there. sir, it was coming at the end. Um, <laughs> so, General, this talk has taken a bit of a traditional flavor, focusing on deterrence theory and the capabilities of our adversaries like Russia and North Korea. Mm -hmm. To what extent is NATO and UCOM embracing and addressing human security issues like the refugee crisis? 
Yeah, thank you. Good. I'm glad you, you asked the question because I really wanted to get at, in, in Warsaw, um, what you saw mostly uh, publicized was about deterrence and about the Baltics and enhanced forward presence. But actually they made some very, I think, significant decisions um, to um, support what we call the uh, NATO Strategic Defense South. Okay, so it's a framework that's been developed that addresses the challenges to Europe from the South, and those are primarily uh, the issues of the, the refugee crisis, counterterrorism, uh, counter uh, trans transnational crime, um, counter uh, WMD, the issues that Europe's struggling with in other areas. And so Warsaw addressed a 360, not just the Russia front. Now, what came out of that will, will eventually be in order to me as the SAC Euro to assist in the ways that NATO can assist. And I think we can do that through maritime operations, for, in, for instance, uh, as we're doing in the Aegean uh, with the EU. And that operation has been very successful. You know, last summer, we, uh, you know, we had, um, I think, on order of about probably 60, I'm thinking about 60,000 come across through Greece over a three-month period, April, May, and June. This year, it's you know below 6,000. So we're, we're talking a 90% reduction as a result of the operations there. So I think assistance throughout the Mediterranean can help, particularly where you see refugees coming from North Africa across into Southern Europe, and you see terrorists or the movement of uh, weapons of mass destruction, weaponry as a part of criminal organizations as well. So we are addressing it, and you'll see more on that as we work our way through the orders from the NATO Alliance to North Atlantic, North Atlantic Council uh, to, to us and our forces in shape. In, in what I hope uh, we will be able to describe as a post-ISIS world with the region bordering uh, NATO in such turmoil, do you think NATO can be a force for restabilizing uh, its periphery. Is, is that something, this, this is a military alliance, it's not a traditional military job. Would you be comfortable with that? I, I, I do. I mean, obviously, what we go into is, again, the North Atlantic Council, that's policy. I, I act on the, on the directives they give me as the SAC year. But for instance, at Warsaw, we had uh, deterrence and defense as a major theme. And we have projecting stability, which we haven't talked about much. But NATO's been in that business for a while as well. Um, you know, in Kosovo, we have forces there today. We went into Kosovo. In Afghanistan, we're trained, advise, and assist today. We're looking at potentially doing partnership capacity building uh, in perhaps Iraq, if invited, perhaps in Libya. And that, in a sense, is projecting stability so that we solve those problems outside of our borders and thereby keep our security intact as well. And obviously, within the, you know, the countries within NATO, the 28 nations, we have a good deal, deal of experience in stability ops as well. So we, so we could see a NATO deployment in Iraq uh, and in Libya uh, down the road as, the, as the, those fragmented countries try to get back to something more stable? Well, I don't know. Again, that's not... I know it's a policy I, I'm, I'm not making, you know, that projection for NATO. I can't do that. I'm just saying that we have the capability to do that, and we at least at Warsaw said that we would take some steps at Iraq's um, invitation to do some specific training, uh, primarily to help them with the skills they need post-conflict. Uh, in the areas that have been recaptured from counter ISIL. That's primarily what they wanted to start with, as well as mine clearing, et cetera. That's the first step. There may be more that we can do if they ask us to do so. Uh, the gentleman uh, here on, the, on my far right. Jonathan Marks, Candy Group. General Scaparelli, first of all, forgive me for being so far away. Please take this gap as a symbolic Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to Brexit, the United Kingdom was actively campaigning in Europe against the European army. And in fact, ultimately, the United Kingdom had a veto for that. In two years' time, approximately, the UK loses that veto, and it's highly likely that there will be a European Union army of some sort. How confusing will that be to the military slash political situation in Europe, and how will that 
dilute NATO and decrease its efficacy? Well, first of all, I, you know, I, I would just say up front that, that you know, there's each of, our, each of the nations in NATO have one military. And so the intent is going forward that we have a very close working relationship and to the extent that they do operations, and as you know, they do today, that we have a complementary and a close relationship because we really don't have the capability um, to not be complementary and not be wise in how we use all the forces that we have. That's the first point I would make. The second is, is that, again, back to Warsaw, the agreement uh, to cooperate between EU and NATO is very important for many reasons, and, and you cited one, so that we do have a relationship that we are used to, we become used to working together, and we can consider these things uh, in, the, in the best way. Uh, I would say, just as we did in the AGN operations, uh, they asked for our assistance, we did that uh, in about 96 hours time, which those of you, you know, that know NATO, that's, that's lightning speed. So, you know, that's, it, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're moving and uh, we're adapting and we're getting better. So the uh, woman here uh, who has the microphone yes. and then uh, go to you, sir, for the final question. Thank you, General and Mr. Ignatius. I wanted to ask what you could share with us about the relationship, uh, friendship, military relationship between North Korea and Iran? Good question. Uh, Not often asked. Yeah. There, there is a relationship between the two. Um, and it is, it is um, probably, you know, we think complementary in particularly their missile arrangement. Um, and we've seen indications of that. Um, so, you know, that is always of concern. Um, and we watch it closely. So, there, you know, I, that's about as much as I can say about it, that there is a relationship there, and then we've been watching it. Sir. Spasiba, Moy, General. Al Cannon from Charleston, South Carolina. Three quick points. Sir, let me ask you to, because we were running yes, out of time, just distribution, one point. Just three quick points. Distribution of Russians throughout the republics. The historic vulnerability from Russia's perspective of the Baltic state and Poland corridor and Kaliningrad. To what extent is the issue of Russian citizens within the Baltic states a factor in uh, what NATO's trying to do and, and, uh, and Russia's efforts? Well, it's a factor because it's what the Russians uh, in this activity below the threshold of conflict, it's who they're appealing to. It's who they're trying to influence uh, in the Baltic states uh, with some of these information operations, uh, activity with parties, et cetera. So it's of concern to us. Now, the other part is, is working with those governments. Uh, how do you ensure that you bring uh, those of, of Russian heritage fully into your government so that they also are a part of that democracy. So um, General Scaparati told me that he really, really has to leave at six because he's got to fly back tonight to Europe. And then, wonderfully, he is, it's not a scheduled flight, but he's, he's a four-star general. Um, <laughs> wonderfully, he is on his way to do some work in Italy, but also to visit uh, the place where the Scaparatis are from yeah. in Italy. So um, we hope he has a great trip back. And we all, I know, uh, join me in thanking him for a wonderful talk. Thank you.